Well, wonderful to have you here again. The books will still be for sale after the next two speakers, so uh, there will be um, lots of opportunities to, uh, to, uh, to buy. I thought there's a lot of interest, isn't it, Catherine? Wonderful. <laughs> All right. So now we are going to move to, um, well, the wonders of the modern world, because we're now going to see a video presentation by Rose Kerr. And Rose will talk about her new publication, Voice of Clay, the Enduring Beauty of Chinese Ceramics. Um, we've seen Rose Kerr before, but it's always good to mention it. She is an English art historian specialized in Chinese art, especially Chinese ceramics. And she has written on that subject a number of books. In fact, she has a long, long line of publications in her name. She worked at the Percival David Foundation. She joined the Far Eastern Department of the Victoria and Albert Museum in 1978. She became the keeper of the Far Eastern Department in 1987, a post she held until her retirement in 2003. And what is interesting to mention is that she's also an honorary citizen of Jing de Zhen, the historic center of Chinese porcelain. And she's the only person from outside China that has been made an honorary citizen of Xing de Zhen. It's really a very special thing. So I present to you Rose Kerr in a video presentation of the voice. Good day, everyone. I'm sorry that I can't be here with you in person, but I'm very pleased to be able to share this lecture with you today. The lecture is about a wonderful collection here in the Netherlands, um, and I will talk about the collection and its context. So now I'm going to share my screen with you, and we'll start with some pictures. The lecture concerns a private collection of Chinese ceramics made here in the Netherlands. In my opinion, it's, one, it's a great treasure for the country. I was fortunate enough to work with this collection and its owner for several years, and I've so far written two books about the collection. The first is Song Through 21st Century Eyes, Yao Zhou and Qing Bai Ceramics, which was published in 2009. And the second book came out last year in 2021. It's called Voids in Clay, The Enduring Beauty of Chinese Ceramics. And certain pieces from the collection are at present on display at the Rijksmuseum. And this book, Voids in Clay, is on sale in the Rijksmuseum bookshop. Here is a picture of the book which was designed and printed in the Netherlands. It was designed by Emma Baum, who's a great um, and famous book designer. So the book itself is a work of art. Uh, the photography is very high quality, and I hope that the text is also interesting. Now, in these two books, the collector and I shared several points of view for looking at Song ceramics. One of the chief ones was to consider how ceramics were used. Before I get to that point, I want to show you one of the humblest pieces in the collection, which is actually a porcelain waster, a piece which came through the kiln um, and was damaged in firing. This was a piece which we actually collected in Jingda Zhen in 2006, when I went with the collector to the site um, and had a good look around excavations which were going on at that time. <clears throat> on the screen here, you can see photographs of an area, um, a northern Song kiln, which had been excavated and which we called Cupstand Hill because it was full of wasters of cut stands. You can see one there in the bottom picture. All around Jigda Jun, there are huge um, excavated and unexcavated kiln sites 
many of them dating to the Song Dynasty, because during the, Ming, the later Yuan and Ming dynasties, production came into the city, it was more centralized. Whereas during the Song Dynasty, kilns were scattered all around the district and the surrounding hills, so they're quite widespread. And here is um, a perfect cup stand from the collection with a beautiful cup standing in it. This is what the waster shard would have looked like, perhaps, uh, if it had not got ruined in firing. And here is another lovely cup and cup stand dating to the Southern Song Dynasty. So you can see the variety of um, glazes and shapes uh, of all kinds. And one of the things that you can observe in both of these pieces is that they were actually modeled on metalwork, more precisely silver. I think in both pieces you can see that, perhaps particularly in the lower picture, how closely this little faceted cup is modeled on silver. Now, the collection that I'm talking about focused on two areas of collecting Song ceramics, because Song ceramics are a vast um, assemblage of pieces and really to try and uh, collect across the whole field would be very, very difficult indeed. So the collection is chiefly composed of ceramics from Yaozhou up there in the north and Jingdezhen, the Qingbai pieces from the south. I mentioned that one of the concerns that we had in um, producing the books was the use of ceramics. Now here is an assemblage of very rare and precious Yaozhou pieces, chiefly dating to the northern Song dynasty which the collector cooked food for and placed food in the bowls. And we had um, a great deal of fun that day setting up a photo shoot for the photographer to actually photograph these pieces containing what they might have contained when they were originally made. Because one very important point about some ceramics is that they were not works of art when they were made. They were products for use, for daily use. So in some ways, they are just a sophisticated um, part of industrial design. Here's another set of pieces containing food with little serving plates and bowls in front. And so we tried always in the book, and these photographs are included in the new book, Voids in Clay. We tried always to keep this theme in our minds. The uses of song ceramics um, are quite difficult really to um, think about in all their aspects. There are two main ways or perhaps three main ways that we come at evidence for use. The first is in contemporary textual records. There were, for example, a number of accounts of fine living written during the Song Dynasty, where young men talked about how they led fine lives and their descriptions of daily life, eating, drinking, attending festivals, can give us some clues as to use. The second is archaeology. So from kiln sites and tombs, we get some idea, particularly from tombs, how, um, how ceramics could have been used in Song. And the third is from pictorial evidence, and pictorial evidence both from paintings and as here from tomb mules. These come from the Zhang family tombs up in Hebei, which were dating between 1075 and 1125. And the subjects depicted on the walls of the Zhang tombs are tea making. And you can see on the picture on the left, um, in the foreground, I use my little pointer, there's a brazier with hot coals and a ewer with water heating. Now that won't be ceramic, of course, that will be a metal ewer. And then in the background, a big tea mixing bowl with a spoon, a stack of bowls and cup stands. And the same thing in this um, picture, here down below, you can see the brazier again, it's a little damaged. 
and here the tea mixing bowls and the cups and saucers. So if we try and get some idea of what those pieces would have looked like in life, at the top, a beautiful Qingbai bowl in the, this collection, which has actually been bound with a, an engraved silver rim, very rare that. And on the back, what those dark cup stands might have looked like, a, lap, a lacquer cup stand now in the Victoria and Albert Museum. The alcohol and tea in the Song Dynasty was obviously drunk hot, tea with boiling water, alcohol heated to body temperature. On the right hand side, you can see a silver gilt ewer. And in fact, although we see ceramics as being very precious objects, in the Song, the most precious material was really precious metal, gold and silver and ceramics very often copied those forms. On the left, you can see a Qingbai porcelain ewer in its warming bowl. So after the wine had been heated up, it would be poured into the ewer and the ewer would be plunged into a bowl of warm water to keep it warm for the drinkers. Another pictorial piece of evidence. This is from a famous painting called A Literary Gathering. And this shows an outside banquet thrown by the emperor, the emperor Huizong, for scholars and meritorious men who he would invite to dine in the palace gardens. And the interesting thing about this picture is the table. As you can see, it's a low table and the diners are sitting on low stools. And more precisely, if you look at the table layout, very precisely lined up dishes and cups. So in front of each person is a table setting with bowls, dishes, cups, cup stands. And in the middle of the table, laid out in straight lines, big ornamental dishes of fruit and vegetables, nice things to eat. So this form of dining was popular during the Song Dynasty. And in the first book um, that we wrote, we attempted in one picture to do a layout of dishes rather in the manner of this painting. You can see a number of small Qingbai dishes and a couple of silver dishes and a bigger bowl with fruit like those dishes in the middle, the cup and cup stand and the ewer in its warming bowl. And here is another attempt at that table setting this I photographed in Jingda, Jen, about five or six years ago. It was at one of the smaller museums where they had projected a copy of the, the painting on the wall. And in the foreground, they had set out a replica table to replicate what was shown in the painting. Now, I have to tell you that the pieces shown on that table are not genuine Song Dynasty pieces. What they did very cleverly was to get a local factory to make modern copies of the Qingbai porcelain. But it's a very effective way of showing Song Dynasty high dining etiquette. I talked about the um, ewers uh, and the wine drinking. We've seen one ewer and warming bowl from the collection. Here's another rather similar piece, which comes from a tomb dated 1087. And here from the collection is a very beautiful refined cup on a cup stand. And from the collection also a silver version of this. You can see perhaps what I mean when I say that ceramics and porcelain often copied precious metals. It was the precious metals were the prototype and the ceramics copied them. Another picture to illustrate those drinking habits from another tomb, this time dated 1099. And here you can see the tomb occupants, husband and wife. On the table between them, a pair of cups and cup stands, a ewer in a warming bowl. Beneath the table, a bottle with a lid. I'll talk about that more in a minute. And in the background, standing here, these are not servants. This is actually the eldest son and his wife who have come to pay filial duties. 
to their parents. Now on to another um, aspect of use in the song, and that is tea drinking. Here is a foreground detail of that painting, A Literary Gathering, showing you the servants uh, preparing um, drink. Now, it's very interesting to see the variety of equipment that they had to carry with them outside into the garden. Eating outside was quite a business. You needed a big retinue of servants. So here in the foreground is a big tub full of water. Um, here is a covered box to contain the tea and precious items. Here is another of those tall bottles you can see bound with a cloth cap. This is a very intriguing um, item. This is a little covered cabinet which would be used to carry out um, delicate items like little cups and saucers. So it was a sort of carrying um, cabinet. In the background, the servant with the tea bowl and the ladle. And you can see again this habit of the dark cup stand, and this time with brownish tea bowls standing on it. Now, I wanted to talk about this bottle here. Um, these pieces are very um, widely seen amongst song ceramics. We call the shape a maping, which means literally a prunus vase. But in fact, they weren't vases for pruners. They were bottles for alcohol. And in the Song Dynasty, they were called jinping, which means upright bottle. And when you handle a piece like this piece on the left, you'll find it's very heavy because there's a lot of clay in the base of this piece. It has quite a thick base and thick walls at the bottom. And this is to keep it stable, to keep it from falling over. Now, this particular uh, bottle is a very rare and wonderful Yao Zhou example in the collection. These are quite special pieces, not widely seen. More examples of preparing a banquet here. You can see, again, the bottles in the foreground with little lids on them. And the shape of this bowl um, with its lobed sides here in the collection is uh, a Qingbai bowl and the same kind of shape in silver. And here from the collection, an exceptionally rare piece. In fact, I've never seen another piece like this. It is in fact a very thinly made porcelain funnel and the rim has been bound with pure gold. This was undoubtedly for pouring liquids from larger vessels into vessels with uh, narrower necks. But as I say, I've never seen another piece, so it's a really wonderful item. Another use for ceramics and metal um, was to contain flowers. Now, on the back wall of this tomb mural, which dates to 1116, you can see two vases or bottles with flowers in them. Now, we tend to think of Chinese flower arrangements as being very refined, uh, delicate things. But in fact, it seems from pictorial depiction that they used big, full flower arrangements and they put a lot of flowers in vases. Um, it wasn't at all like Japanese flower arranging of today. It's interesting, though, to consider the shape of this vase with the flowers in, which is very much like this beautiful Yaojo bottle in the collection, because exactly the same shape can be seen here on the table where they're preparing tea and wine. And that harkens back to something which we find common. In our culture, you might use a jug to contain milk, a milk jug, but you could use the same jug to put flowers in. So we have to consider vessels having multiple uses, not all the same all the time. And here is another wonderful assemblage of pieces from the collection, all Yaojo pieces. And you can see some of them in use. In the foreground there, that little lamp. Um, and in the background, a beautiful faceted vase with a big full flower arrangement in it. And again, if you look at this vase, you can see how this 
lobed shape very much does imitate metal and probably silver. And again from the collection, um, pieces used in calligraphy, another very important aspect of Chinese scholarly and educated life. Uh, you can see this is a scroll weight actually made of stone in the collection, but it does date to the Song Dynasty. And here a pewter uh, brush stand, a Yao Zhou um, uh, brush washer, a little uh, ink stand, a tiny little water dropper there, um, a box to contain ink cakes, and here in the background, a little incense burner with incense sticks on it. Now, incense is an important subject in Chinese life, um, in the Song Dynasty especially, because incense was widely used. It was one of the scholarly pursuits. And um, incense was used both to perfume the air, but also to keep away um, insect bugs. Um, you had to, if you particularly if you were dwelling outside and in the hot summers, you would need to burn something to keep biting insects at bay. And in the collection are several beautiful um, versions of incense burners. Calligraphy. Um, just on the left there, a gentleman practicing calligraphy and you can see all his scholarly paraphernalia on the desk around him. In the collection are a number of interesting pieces associated with calligraphy. This piece is actually an inkstone. It's shown rather small but in fact it's quite a large piece. It's made of unglazed porcelain and round the side it has a date in the early 12th century and a poetic inscription. And an inkstone was what you ground your ink on when you came to do calligraphy, you would have a, a solid cake of ink and you would grind it onto that ink stone and mix it with water. When you had um, come to a pause in your writing or painting, you might want to rest your brush with its tip upwards so that the ink didn't spread onto your paper or onto the table. And this is a little Qing Bai um, brush rest the brush would rest across the small of the back of the small boy shown here. And this is a little Yao Zhou um, brush rest. This is a little water dropper. And water droppers, when you make the ink, it's important that you don't pour out a solid stream of water. You want the water to come out drop by drop. So you can see this small piece has got a very upright spout. And we tried this piece, we actually filled it with liquid. And when you pour it, water comes out, drop, drop, drop in a very satisfying way. And here's another little water dropper. This is a very clever little piece because the only way to fill it is through a hole in the base. So you immerse the vessel upside down in water. And when you turn it the right way, it has a double wall inside it. And so the water doesn't come out the hole in the bottom. So it's a little joke water dropper. And this, again, a very unique little piece. This is a little basin or a little cup for water. And in the middle here, this lotus leaf. When you had moistened your brush, you would draw your brush upwards against the petals of the flower to shape it into a point. And here, a little set of stamps, all made in porcelain, inside their own porcelain box, again in the collection. Another use for ceramics, and that was chess playing, in particular Weiqi, the intellectual game. And here you can see um, a Song Dynasty or a Five Dynasties uh, painting of chess playing, and here a modern interpretation. Wei Qi is a very complicated game played with black and white stones and the aim of the game is to encircle your opponent's pieces and to remove them from the board. And in the collection there is this rare and wonderful chess box which came complete with its own Song Dynasty stones. Uh, they were all of a piece and you can see the stones set out in the background there in a game and I think you can tell who's winning. Uh, the white has encircled the black. So these little boxes um, with bosses round the top 
These are very often called cosmetic boxes, but in fact they are, they're chess boxes. A humble vessel, you can see it held in the arms of a servant here in this imperial portrait, and here from the tomb murals again. This is sometimes called a spittoon, but in fact it isn't for spitting into, it's a slop smart vessel. And you have to think of the time before there was plumbing and running water, when you wanted to dispose of any liquid waste, you had these, piece, these vessels with narrow necks and you'd pour the dregs into them and a servant would carry them away. And here in the collection is a beautiful Northern Song Dynasty Qingbai slops jar. These are relatively uncommon. They don't survive in large numbers, perhaps because they often got broken. And another use for porcelain um, associated with religion. Here you can see a, a beautiful bodhisattva from a cave temple drawing dating to the 10th century. And in his left hand, he's holding this kundika. The kundika is a round vessel with a tall neck and a spout on its shoulder. And it was used in Buddhist ceremonies for pouring water in purification ceremonies. And very often um, white porcelain, in particular Ding and Qingbai porcelain is associated with Buddhism. I just show you this picture taken from a Liao dynasty tomb um, of a high-ranking Buddhist monk. The tomb contains sutra plates in solid gold. So this was somebody of quite high status. But also in the tomb were white porcelains of all kinds. And Buddhists favoured white jade, white glass, white rock crystal and white porcelain, all of which transmitted light through their walls. And here again is um, a Buddhist painting, and you can see the Kundika here, the purification vessel. And here in the collection is a beautiful Northern Song Dynasty Qingbai Kundika um, of a type which would have been used. Now, I've talked so far about um, Yaozhou and Qingbai, and I mentioned that those were the pieces um, which made up the majority of the collector's Song Dynasty collection. I want to just conclude this talk by talking about some rare, very rare examples that the collector has recently made, and these are of Neolithic ceramics. Um, and they're very intriguing pieces. So here is um, a piece dating to the Longshan period, a cup with a tall stem. And you can see that it's made of black burnished pottery. These um, Longshan pieces um, are very, very light and thin. When you pick them up, they are literally as light as paper. It's quite a surprise when you pick them up. This is very sophisticated potting technology because these vessels are made of loessic clay and they're turned down to paper wafer thinness on a wheel. Then they often have pierced designs. You can see on the stem of this piece, this pierced design. And if you look at this piece, the most uh, astonishing thing about it is that it would appear to copy a metal prototype. But these date to the Neolithic period, the period before metal was made. And so, and metal vessels have never been found in Wongshan contexts. So it's one of the great mysteries of early Chinese ceramic making as to where these extraordinary shapes came from. The black color is also very intriguing because it's not um, coloured with, with um, a surface glaze or, or polish. These pieces were fired in a wood firing kiln in a very heavily reducing atmosphere, which means that the kiln vents were all closed and carbon monoxide built up in the kiln. And the blackening is actually soot, which is impregnated the surface of the vessel. 
So if you look at a, a broken fragment of these uh, Longchamp pieces, you can see that the black goes right into the surface of the vessel. It's not just on the top. So goodness knows how this sophisticated technology came about, uh, probably firstly accidentally, but then carefully followed. And the collection contains Neolithic uh, pieces from these two early cultures in China, the Darwin Ko culture and the Longshan culture, which came after it, as you can see. And both of these cultures come from northeastern China, from Shandong province, and they are completely different to any early ceramics made elsewhere in China or indeed anywhere else in the world. They are deeply mysterious pieces. And the collector in, in latter years has become fascinated with these pieces, which are quite difficult to come by. So I just showed you a Longshan piece. Here are some pieces which are even earlier. These are Darwin Co. You can see they were made more than four and a half thousand years ago. Um, extraordinary pieces. On the right, a black burnished piece with a pierced stem. Again, it looks so much like a metal shape, doesn't it? And on the left, two white pieces made of white earthenware clay. And the exciting thing about these pieces, to my mind, apart from their extraordinary shapes uh, and technology, is that these were actually made of kaolin clay. So these were made of naturally occurring kaolins, North Chinese kaolins. They were not fired to the temperature of porcelain, but it, they have the same essential body material as porcelain. So in a way, you could say that these very early white Darwin Co. Um, Neolithic pieces are the great, great, great grandmothers of Chinese porcelain. And over thousands of years, Chinese potters used these white clays. They refined them ever more. They improved their kiln technology until suddenly, somewhere around the year 600 AD, they started to make pure white porcelain. So that's my introduction to this fascinating collection. These Neolithic pieces are not currently on display, but I'm hoping that in the future, the Rijks Museum might think about displaying some more pieces from this, this collection, because I have to tell you that here, right in the middle of the Netherlands, you have a unique um, and valuable and a wonderful collection of ceramics dating to the Song Dynasty, and then a portion dating way back to the Neolithic. So I hope this has whetted all your appetites and that you'll go and see the pieces on display and perhaps even buy a copy of our book, Voids in Clay. Thank you. Thank you, Rose, for a wonderful presentation. And Rosaline, you will tell her how thrilled we were when... Uh, I was using the Thank you. Well, now we move to the final part of our presentation today. Denise Campbell will tell us about the Behind Beauty exhibition at the Asian Pavilion. And after the presentation, you will be able to go to the pavilion. And uh, well, um, Denise is now presently the curator of Asian ceramics at the Prinsessenhof National Museum of Ceramics in Leeuwarden and we can only recommend to go there to, to see it. Um, before that, um, uh, she studied in Groningen, Groningen University, Master of Arts 2014. 
Uh, interesting to mention is that from 2017 to 2019, you were very busy helping to catalog the Chinese ceramics at the Staatliche Kunstsammlungen in Dresden, the, the famous collection of August the Strong. From 2019 to 2022, before you moved to uh, Leeuwarden, you were curatorial assistant for the arts department here at the Rijksmuseum, which is still part of your home, I guess. So I give the floor to <laughs> Denise Campbell. Thank you, Peter, for this introduction. and. Uh, Welcome everyone, good afternoon. Um, well, I, I, I had prepared an introduction for myself, but it's not, uh, it's not necessary, so I will just uh, move on immediately. Um, and I will be talking, I don't know where to point it, talking uh, uh, to you uh, today about, am I close enough to the microphone? Better? Um, so, um, as Peter said, I'm the former uh, curatorial assistant to the arts department, um, uh, including the Asian art department here at the Rijks Museum. Um, not anymore, as of September, I've made the move to the Princess of Ceramics, uh, National Ceramics Museum, so very, very recently. Um, the presentation I will be talking about is uh, called Behind Beauty, the depiction of women on Chinese porcelain. And uh, it has been on view for a while now, since uh, April 2002. And it will be on view until April 2023, next year. So if you can't make it this afternoon, there's still some time. So first of all, I'd like to talk a little bit about the context around this uh, presentation. Um, as cura curatorial assistant here, I was part of the working group uh, Women of the Rijks Museum. And this uh, wor uh, working group started um, uh, a big four-year uh, program, a research project, uh, into the role of women within the Rijks Museum, as, uh, as the name says. And this research project um, was twofold. So on uh, the one hand, they were looking into uh, the role of women in the organizational history of the Rijksmuseum, so the Rijksmuseum as an institute, and on the other side, more into the art history, the role of women into the art history uh, side and into the collection of the Rijksmuseum. And um, from this uh, working group, I thought it was very interesting to include also the Asian Art Department and the Asian Pavilion uh, into this research project, which resulted in uh, the April changeover at the Asian Pavilion, um, which was uh, mainly focused on uh, the perspective of women. So we had uh, Behind Beauty that is still on display and also a display of Indian miniatures, which unfortunately uh, changed in uh, last, last October, so recently, but now there's a the very nice collection of Japanese prints um, collected by Elise Vessels, still downstairs, so I invite you all to go. Um, so that's more about the, the background. Um, I must say that um, I, I'm not an expert at all in this uh, subject. Um, uh, as I started, uh, preparing this presentation, it hadn't been the focus of, of my research at all before this. So um, what I started doing was simply looking through the collection and see what we actually had of Chinese porcelain with depictions of women. Um, and as you uh, might uh, be able to imagine, there were a lot, <laughs> like really a lot. So uh, the problem was more of, um, how to, to choose, how to choose these uh, sort of 50 objects that would fit into the, the big China display downstairs and um, make an understandable story out of this. Um, so after I, I got a sense of, of what the collection was that we, we've ha we have here in, uh, uh, in storage mainly, um, I started organizing 
objects into group. I think uh, we humans like to organize and make sense of large uh, quantities of objects, as did, did I. So I came um, to different uh, themes, which will be discussed in the presentation, uh, like, for example, the, the more the European view on the Asian women um, in the Long Eliza and goddesses, uh, more traditional women in traditional roles, um, women from literature and uh, female warriors, for example. So um, how the story begins is uh, actually um, a very long time ago in the 12th, 13th century on uh, Sijo wares. So that was um, the first type of wares that, that had depictions of uh, women, mostly from narrative scenes. And over the course of the next um, centuries, uh, the, the decorations became more and more elaborate until the transitional period, uh, which uh, Catherine also uh, discussed briefly, where there was an enormous boost of um, uh, freedom into designs. And also, like Theresa mentioned, uh, there was an enormous boost in the availability of uh, woodblock prints, uh, especially with these uh, vernacular subjects, so more uh, subjects from uh, theater or literature, and also uh, the subject of the, the beautiful woman known as the Meiren. So um, we can sort of see like uh, that this uh, interest in the 17th century, like this, this enormous boost uh, of interest um, in these kinds of subjects in woodblock prints and paintings coincide with uh, the enormous rise of uh, the depictions of women on Chinese porcelain, um, which were many, 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 many in the 17th century. And then in the 18th century, we sort of see uh, a, a, a split in directions. So we still have the narrative scenes based on uh, literature or uh, theater, for example. But we also see that during the 17th century, um, the uh, female um, figures, were taken out of their narrative context and were shown by themselves on porcelain. So I will discuss a few objects. Uh, as I, I mentioned, there were around 50 in the display. I'm not gonna talk about all of them, but just a few to, to give you a sense of, of what it is. And I will be downstairs later, so if there are more questions, um, I'm happy to answer them. Um, this uh, is an image from which I, I put in the group of uh, the Long Eliza. Um, I will uh, briefly give my interpretation of the Long Eliza because I believe there are, are many, many different interpretations of what, what exactly is a Long Eliza. Um, for me, it can, it, it can be actually uh, any Asian woman uh, on Chinese porcelain, um, as you look through the, the, the auction catalogs, for example, or old um, estates, um, how do you call them, boodles. Um, many, many objects that, that depict women were named as with Lysen or with, uh, uh, with the Lange Lysen. So uh, for me, it, it could have been anything. Um, Within this, this sort of framework, I uh, chose to put the very famous image of the parasol lady in this group. Um, it's a design by Cornelis Pronk. Probably most of you here know the story behind this subject, but for those of you who don't, I will briefly um, elaborate. Uh, Cornelis Pronk was hired by the Dutch East India Company to um, create uh, designs for porcelain, which he did. He cr created a couple of designs. Uh, I believe he finished them in 1734. In 35, they were sent to, uh, to China and were um, actually transferred onto, onto porcelain. The most famous one was this, the parasol lady. Um, unfortunately, they proved too expensive to keep producing, so the Dutch East India Company um, didn't produce them for a very long time, but um, the decoration sort of took on a life of its own after that, 
as it was quite popular and we see um, also, uh, for example, freely interpreted copies on Japanese porcelain. Um, but in the con within the context of this presentation, um, I chose it because it, it shows um, like a European view of what the Asian woman is. And um, as I've, I've learned yesterday on a, a very nice symposium that was talking about the, the um, Herold Meissen images, like the, the chinoiserie images, um, it was not meant to be an exact copy of Asian ceramics. It wasn't meant to be uh, looking like exactly like it came from China, but it was more of like an illustration of the European idea of Asianness, I would say. So uh, you see here a, a very common image of two women, a lady accompanied by uh, her maid holding a parasol above her head. And what I find particularly interesting is um, that these two, the images of the woman has been exactly copied into the border decoration as well. So this is something that you see a lot on Chinese porcelain, that you have these ground decorations uh, on the border um, with these um, spread out cartouches um, filled with decorations. And it's interesting to me that the design of the women hasn't changed at all in the border decoration. It's They're exactly in the same pose, only out of the context of the main uh, image and just replica replicated on the border. So the second group I'd like to discuss is, are the, the goddesses. They are uh, very um, commonly seen on, uh, on Chinese porcelain. Um, this plate was not identified actually in our collection database. Um, which doesn't mean that the knowledge wasn't there. It was there. <laughs> it was just not written down into the collection database. So this is also a call to action for all the people working in museums to please write down all that fabulous knowledge that is in your head for um, future generations to use, like me. Um, what is depicted here is uh, the goddess of longevity, Magu. And she is um, uh, often depicted as wearing um, a deer skin, that she is, is clothed in deer skin. And on her belt, she um, carries uh, a gourd shaped bottle holding the wine of the Ling Chi, the mushroom of um, longevity or immortality. And she is often accompanied by a, um, a little boy servant, as we can see here as well. And normally the servant would hold like a basket of peaches, the peaches of immortality. Um, in this specific case, um, it's very difficult to discern what, what he is actually holding in his hand. But since his hat is also covered with uh, some type of fruit, um, I would say it's safe to assume that it's, uh, it could be a peach. Um, and what's interesting um, about this uh, saucer is it's quite small it's it's like this i think i thought it was bigger looking at the image but it's quite small and what what's interesting is that it has a, a european coat of arms at the top and also a monogram here at the bottom um, so it's interesting to think that uh, this was a, a commissioned product um, and uh, to think about what's uh, what was the background about these commissions? Would people um, commission a specific plate with a specific decoration, or was it a depiction of a, a long elise, which was interesting to them, or um, yeah, or did they just not know and didn't really care? Unfortunately, we don't know anything about the provenance of this dish. Um, it's an unidentified coat of arms, so. Up until now, unfortunately, nothing else can be said about, um, uh, about these ideas. So another group is uh, um, discussing gender roles very briefly. Um, and I find this plate quite interesting as I find all plates, so that's not a special thing. So um, this, um, 
plate has been registered as a saucer dish depicting the story of the Oxford and the Weaver Girl, um, which indeed it holds many, many um, elements of. Um, for those of you who don't know the story uh, about the Oxford and the Weaver Girl is that there was a celestial being, a Weaver Girl, who fell in love with a mortal Oxford and uh, they decided to, to get married and uh, even have two children, but uh, this was not allowed and the gods were very angry about this, so they were uh, forced to, to um, separate to either sides of the Milky Way. And on every seventh day of the seventh month, they were allowed to rejoin, and this would happen through uh, a, a magical bridge of magpies who would all come together so they could walk to each other and meet each other again. Um, I've heard it's also known as Chinese Valentine's Day. Um, so this is um, what I discussed about with my colleagues as the interpretation of this, uh, this plate. Um, for me, I'd like to add a, a, a second layer, which is that of the um, Chinese saying of um, men plow, women weave, um, which talks about the traditional division of labor in Chinese society, but also um, about the places that uh, men and women held in this society. So place, the place of the respectable woman was inside of the house and the domain of men was outside. And um, I think this could be a depiction of, of that notion because of course we have all the elements of the story of the Oxford and the Weaver Girl. We have the, the woman weaving, we have an, an ox, we have a bridge which is made of wood and not magpies. But since um, I believe the man is, is uh, specifically and quite um, clearly holding something like uh, a plow, also center, center stage, um, and the woman is placed uh, so deliberately inside of a house, I think it also could refer to this uh, traditional no notion. Um, as we've heard today before as well, um, um, this is a depiction of um, a scene from the Romance of the Western Chamber, um, which is from a very interesting group of porcelain here at the collection in the Rijksmuseum um, that my colleague Jan has wrote, written a very interesting article about. Um, these uh, plaques or plates or panels of porcelain, um, probably made in, uh, in Canton, or painted in Canton, and um, they depict various scenes uh, from literature, or from mythology, and this is a scene from the Romance of the Western Chamber, again, where the two main characters um, uh, uh, say goodbye to each other in the monastery where they first met. Um, then finally, and this is one of my favorite objects, is um, uh, an example from the uh, warriors group, the, the group of the female warriors, um, which in Chinese history there have been different uh, periods in time where female warriors were uh, allowed to fight but also celebrated for their achievements. And what we see here on these uh, two square bottles uh, downstairs, they are presented together are scenes from um, the collected stories of uh, the generals of the Yang family. And um, um, uh, in these stories is, is a special place for, for women. And um, there are a lot of, uh, lots, of, lots of information about um, the achievements of women within this family. And uh, one of my favorite sections is when um, all the men have perished in war, defending their nation, their country, and then the matriarch of the family steps up and says, okay, women, now we have to do it. And they set out to battle and, uh, and prevail. Um, so this is a very, very interesting piece. Um, I believe there are more examples uh, around in other collections. And what we see here, and I've enlarged it also here, is uh, a female general sitting uh, behind the table. So 
Um, what can also happen when you look through a collection in its entirety with this very, very broad perspective is that um, you will find con connections that maybe you wouldn't have found otherwise. So uh, a connection that I found interesting is that of the, um, the female dancer. This is also um, like a decorative element that you see um, in, in many different ways, also in porcelain and other uh, mediums. But here she's part of a story. Um, so what is depicted here is uh, the birthday celebration of the Queen Mother of the West. One second. So the birthday celebration of the Queen Mother of the West. Um, unfortunately, you cannot see her from here, but downstairs you can. She's here on the right, uh, sitting in front of a folding screen and surrounded by uh, her servants. And she's looking at uh, a music um, performance by a female orchestra. And uh, this female dancer here that's uh, performing a very specific dance. And when I was uh, gathering the um, objects for this display, um, I was looking at this ovoid jar, which has different medallions uh, showing different um, scenes. And uh, a couple of scenes were already identified as of being from the romance of the Western Chamber. This one uh, was not yet, but um, I think it's qu quite clear <laughs> to see that it's uh, the same image. Um, it's the dancer together with uh, the Queen Mother of the West in front of her screen. Um, and we can see here that the, the um, context um, has become very small. It has condensed. Uh, there is no more female orchestra. There is no more servants surrounding the Queen Mother of the West. It's only the two main elements of the dancer and the Queen Mother of the West, which still makes it recognizable to see as that it's um, uh, coming from that specific uh, scene. And then this is maybe a little bit of a reach, but um, I was quite excited about it. Um, you, you have uh, in the in the Kangxi period, you have these kinds of garnitures uh, filled with with um, what I would call again the the long Elizas, and this is really the female figure as a decorative element. There is no narrative story at all. There is no importance. It's just a woman repeated um, very often uh, on this uh, on this garniture. But um, as we now know, those figures come from somewhere. They are not just coming from someone's imagination as I'm going to depict a, a woman like this. So my interpretation of this, and I don't have my blinker. I promised I, promised I would stay here with the microphone, but I'm going to walk over there. is uh, a depiction of a woman. And uh, this woman is, is uh, a bit different than the rest, because most of the women that we see are holding a fan or a twig. And uh, this um, woman is in a very particular pose, a bit stiff, a bit awkward. And she's holding her hands in, in a bit of a weird way. So my mind immediately went, to the dancer and uh, to think that this could maybe be the continuation of taking these women out of their narrative um, surroundings and in really transform them into a uh, decorative element. So um, this is the one and only loan in the presentation. Uh, it's actually um, from my collection now. Um, sorry? Princess of. <laughs> yes, Princess of, yeah. 
<laughs> no, I wish I had this at home. Um, <clears throat> no, this is from the Princess of Museum. And I, I really, really wanted to include it um, in this presentation because it's such a, a fun image of women and actually quite early 15th century depiction of women playing football, um, uh, which is it's so fun to me. And uh, apparently I didn't know anything about this. My uh, 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 predecessor, Eline van den Berg, uh, sent this piece to me uh, and she said it definitely has to be in the presentation um, because it shows uh, uh, women playing uh, this game called uh, Kuju and um, they say it's the the origin of soccer um, people probably have strong opinions about that so I wouldn't <laughs> elaborate um, but it was played a lot uh, at the imperial courts by both men and uh, women, and it's, this is uh, a, a wonderful depiction of that. So what I wanted to, to say with this is make the bridge to my current position at the Prinsessenhof National Ceramics Museum, um, and uh, uh, just state that there is uh, a lot more to find out. <laughs> This is a, a small overview of uh, all the objects that I could find with uh, a woman or a lady in the title in the collection database of, uh, of the Prinsessenhof. And I found 380 records, but there must be much more because on a collection of 8,000, I think we have more women in the collection. So, um, just to say that it's not nearly, nearly finished. Uh, there is a, a lot more to be found, uh, specifically in connection to, um, to the uh, Dutch collections. As Peter already stated, I, I worked briefly for the Porcelansammlung as well in Dresden. And, and I was informed two days ago that uh, they recently uh, published, or at least uh, a researcher, Sarah Fraser, published a wonderful, extensive um, research into the depiction of women uh, in the collection of Augustus the Strong. And they took it even wider because they also incorporated how these objects were placed um, uh, in the interiors. So I would definitely recommend that. <clears throat> Um, and that's it for me today, <laughs> so... <laughs> yes, if there are any questions, I'd love to answer them. In the time uh, of the ladies with football, did the ladies have small feet already in that time? Sorry, again? Did the ladies have small feet in that time, minor feet? Uh, yes. Yeah, but even that, in the small feet, they could play a bit football. <clears throat> ah, <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> I haven't researched that. I haven't looked into that, so <laughs> I don't have an answer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Probably with great difficulty. Any more questions? Well, you, know, you, you may also pose your questions because you will uh, go with us to the Asian Pavilion. Yes. And uh, <laughs> Jan van Kampen will be there too. Huh? You told me. Um, so we had a wonderful program this afternoon, um, an astonishing program to hear so much about this wonderful collection that you're all going to visit in Dorset, I presume. <laughs> it may be something for the travel committee of the Royal Asian Art Society, isn't it? So what, uh, that may be a nice plan for the future. So. Um, we'll end the presentations. There will still be the possibility to, uh, to buy the book with beautiful signatures. And uh, the rest of us, we will all go to the Asian Pavilion. And Rosaline has some presents yes. for our... 
our speakers. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentations. The book is the Asian art collection at Rijksmuseum, and to a large part, for a, a large part, it, it is part of the collection of the society as well. And I also want to thank Rosaline and Celine for organizing the whole thing because it's a lot of work, I can tell you. Thank you. We'll see you next time.